is um, the factor is uh, older vineyards. These are 70 to 90 year old vines. They're all out in the western Barossa, uh, northwest of Barossa. Uh, seven of them. To me, you know, this is quintessential Barossa Valley Shiraz. Dark berries, dark chocolate, licorice, and all that sort of stuff. Lovely thing about 07 is I said because it's a warm and dry year. Technically, it's drought year. I must admit that's a bit of an overused term. If it's blow over rainfall, it's a drought year. There's droughts and there's droughts. You know. So 07, you might want to give your glass just a rinse. Yeah, give it a rinse with that and then uh, just to get rid of that TCA. Um, but the 07 finish being warm and dry, the wines have a lovely smokiness, that sort of charcuterie character already coming through, you know, that roasted meat sort of thing which you don't normally see in the sort of more cooler years, but in the warmer years it comes out earlier, so that's why it makes, in my mind, it makes it more approachable. Mm, and you see on the palate, lovely richness. Yeah. It also, you know, it's very, very soft already on the palate, and that's once again those warmer years, the tannins tend to get more like that, whereas the younger years, the cooler years, the tannins are a bit more tightly wound. They just take a bit longer to soften. Now under the Torbrek label, mm -hmm. which was the first of these wines that you produced? Uh, Steading and Runrig. So it was, oh, oh, sorry, 95 Runrig, 96 Steading. So they okay. were the first two wines that I released in about 98. And then came the Factor in 98, and another one called The Descendant, which is a single vineyard of Shiraz Cove Meadow with Viognier. That first vintage was 98. Okay. Then the Juvenile was 99 2000, it went into France in 2001, then it started to come over here. Uh, the Sturry was 2001, the first vintage. The Peck was until about 2004. Okay. So bit by bit by bit, and it's what's happened in these days in particular is, you know, if I get a vineyard that we're not normally making blended, more blended wines now, but if we get a vineyard that, you know, like I said, that the Les Amis, the Grenache came on in 01, the Peck came on in 04, I actually make a single vineyard, Eden Valley one that came in 05. Um, we make a very luxury cuvo, if you like, uh, Shiraz that started in 05, a thing called the Laird. Um, so, you know, more so these days. I, I don't necessarily try to make more wines, but if I get a vineyard that says something to me quite specific and has a really individual personality, and what I consider like the Eden Valley ones, quintessentially Eden Valley, so then I'll bottle as a single bottling. But I still believe, in general, the Barossa Valley being a warmer, drier place is better for blended wines. Because when you've got those warmer, you know, the, that sort of climate, the wines, the single vineyard wines can tend to be, well, they can be one dimensional anyway, but in the warmer climates they tend to be a little bit singular, so in general it's better off blending. But if I get a site like I have with some of them that are just, you know, do manage to be good on their own. So Runrig is my oldest vineyard, there's, there's eight of them now, there has been for quite some time. These are uh, 105 to 165 year old vines, average yields of. 14 hectolitres, 15 hectolitres, you know, around a tonne of the acre. Two and a half years in wood, um, all French. Oh, the fact is two years in wood, 30% new oak. The run rig's two and a half years in wood, 60% new oak. But you can't see it. I mean, that's the great thing. The older the vineyards are, the lower the yields. You get more fruit tannin, they can carry more oak tannin. Okay. And then literally the day before it goes down the bottom line, it gets a splash of your name. What are, um, you mentioned the age of these vines. What yeah. are some of the oldest... Oh, what are the oldest vines that are known in Australia? Uh, the oldest one's the Langmile Freedom Vineyard. So that would be probably almost 140 years old now. So it's the oldest that I know, and I'm pretty sure that's the oldest one. There's a few old. This, this one's the oldest one of these is getting there. It's only a few years behind. But the Langmile, from what I understand, what most of us, I mean, we recognise that as being the oldest, oldest vineyard left in the valley. And a lot of these got pulled out in the 80s. That's a sad thing. Yeah. The government's con sponsored vine pool. Scheme that pulled out a lot of the old vines, which is kind of sad. Luckily, there was growers that just said, "No, we're not doing. We've always been doing this." You know, I've got growers that they're now it's the fifth, in fact, the sixth generation, just about to start working on the, or have started working on the vineyards that their forebears planted. Just mm -hmm. been two, you know, the, the brosser would have almost died. You know, mm -hmm. there was people, you know, nobody wanted. I mean, said Shiraz was a dirty word. Nobody was paying for it. Um, it was just the place was literally on its knees. It was almost a done deal, and um, luckily it. Uh, Enough of it stayed in, and you know things are turning. Look at now. I mean, to think of that, think of that now, it's just crazy. It's crazy. And has Australian wine suffered um, an image problem in other no. markets abroad as much as in the U.S.? Or no, no because you know other markets don't sell shit like Molly Duker, Basically, yeah. Molly Duker and the R wines. I mean, those guys should be put up against the wall and shot. 
Sarah and Sparky are nice people. I shouldn't say that, but uh -huh. their wines are their wines are just atrocious. And unfortunately, people we were talking about that a bit earlier. Unfortunately, people think that's would lead to believe, and especially if you what Jay Miller used to write, and the are wines too, which did as much damage. Um, used to think that that's what good Australian wine was, and I thought, well, if that's good Australian wine, then we all know those wines. They you know they don't last they don't last 20 minutes in your glass, let alone three to five years in the bottle. But the trouble is that gave us a really bad reputation and we all got tarred with that brush and I'm still fighting against it now. Luckily I'm finding, especially on this trip, I've just been in DC and Virginia and New York and you know so on and I'm just finding that people now are starting to come back to the world with Australian wine because mm. they've got their fingers burnt and they you know, and especially then the GFC happened so they started to stop buying wine and drinking what was in their cellar and drinking a lot of this and it just turned to shit in the cellar which was pretty obvious it was going to happen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, that really hurt us. But and the Australian wine industry's got as much of itself to blame. But there's yeah, the two main culprits are Molly Duker and the Dan Phillips and the R wines. So more, more so than the uh, or equally with the lower end of the no, market. No, I don't think people brand. drink yellow tail and stuff like that. I mean, it's what it is. I mean, mm. I I don't drink yellow tail, but I don't think people are going to drink yellow tail or even going to drink Tilbrook and vice versa. Sure. I, I don't mean to sound like a snob and elite, but that's just a fact. So that's fine. I, I don't think, and I know we were talking about the critter thing, but I'm not sure. Yeah, that, that hurt to an extent, but most of the people drinking, paying that sort of price for wine, mm -hmm. they're just going to go and buy another wine at that sort of price. I, I don't think that was it that what hurt the hiring, because I consider myself in the fine wine business, not in. Right. You know, it was the fact that all those R wines and Molly Duke and stuff were being reviewed and sold as fine wine when they're not fine wine. They're beverage wine, you know right. what I mean? But they're, yeah. they're, what we call in Australia a wonderful term, we call them mutton dressed up as lamb. You know, I think a great way to describe, you know, Sparky Marquis' winemaking style is for people to understand that he's actually the top of the tree of Amway sales in South Australia. Okay. So that kind of describes his mentality. Some people love Amway, mm -hmm. but he sort of he puts the Amway philosophy into his winemaking, should we say. Okay. And um, going forward, crucial maybe to get to, I, I don't know who's making the taste anymore, you know, it's not so much Parker anymore, but maybe... Sommeliers and uh, the people. Yeah, that I think, well, that, that's, I mean, that's a good thing and a bad thing because the sommeliers are the ones that really turned the switch off quick. Yeah. Um, but I, can, so I can't really blame them. I can understand it because so much of this crap was just bad, you know. And so I can understand why they've done it. I mean, Bob, or, or Lisa, or probably Brown, of course, who writes for Bob now, is still important. Mm -hmm. um, Spectator, or as we know, are just like, you know, you can't trust a word they tell you. Uh, Stephen Tans is still quite strong, but I think these days with bloggers, you know, there's a lot of blogging. Well, what we're doing now, I mean, this, right. this is the sort of stuff that I think because it's the information so much sort of so much more accessible now. Mm -hmm. um, so people are getting down to, you know, you got to remember the funny thing is about these wines that gave us a bad. It's a bit like Fosters. No self-respecting Australian will drink Fosters. That was just a brand that was made as an export brand, and we all laughed at the Paul Hogan commercials. You know what I mean? Well, same with Molly Duker and our wines and stuff. No self-respecting Australian wants to drink those wines. But that sort of kind of gives you an idea of, you know, you go back to Australia and you find us all these young kids on the street corners making incredible wines, like fantastic wines, and a lot of natural wine, and a lot of people using new varieties and biodynamic. And that's what's exciting about Australia. Mm -hmm. The sad thing is because the market here got flooded with not very good Australian wine, and people got turned off against it. You're not now, now not seeing a lot of the really good stuff out of Australia is actually not coming here, which is kind mm -hmm. of sad. I think it will change, but it'll take time because you've got to get people over that, you know, over yeah. that bump. I, I read a, uh, a fantastic book by Max Allen oh, okay. to pretty yeah. much the same effect yeah. that, that yeah. you were just saying. And I think Andrew Jefford has a book coming out in the near future that he spent a year down there researching yeah, Australian I would be, terroir. I don't know. I'd be very careful about it. According to Andrew Jefford, the only person that understands to is Brian Crozer, who in Australia we call Brian Crozer Australia's greatest winemaker who's never made great wine. And of course, I don't think it's any coincidence that they calls Brian Crozer the only Australian winemaker who understands to are oh, okay. when you find out that Brian Crozer actually funded Andrew's trip for you to Australia. So I didn't know that. That kind of tells you something about it, doesn't okay. it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was actually quite excited when Andrew came. He actually came to the winery, tasted all our wines, and and I didn't realise that he came out with a pretty clear agenda, and it wasn't uh, wasn't the one we all thought he came out for. So it was kind of sad. Okay. Inside politics. Uh, it's the same as anything, you know. These guys call them themselves journalists, which is kind of funny. I should call them some sort of I think that's a much better term for them.